Hello to another episode of The Right Partner Matters. Today we want to talk about the HMI. How user-friendly it is is going to make a huge difference to keeping your machine running or changing it over. So today I'm here with Sean Cheney, our Chief Controls Engineer, to show us how Pearson is bringing an intuitive user face to life. So Sean, what makes Pearson's HMI easy to use? Well, there are a number of things that make it really easy to use. Uh, if we look at any of the machines, the, uh, the HMI has the same look and feel across all the equipment. We can see that it has a really simple menu. It has icons that are simple to follow and use. And uh, it's very much like a kind of a web-based experience or a, a mobile phone type of experience and as we look at this menu and can see how easy it is to navigate around the, the HMI. Can you show us some of the most commonly used features that help an operator that is new to the equipment to be uh, independent more quickly? Certainly. So I'm going to go to the uh, the help menu and we can see that there are some uh, some training items here so that they can look and see um, how to check out a, a proximity sensor. Now that might be more uh, valuable for a maintenance person, but uh, an operator can certainly do that as well. Um, also, um, in the help section, we've got some, uh, some documents that are available so they can look at the electrical schematics or user manual. Um, but for an operator that just really wants to jump into this, uh, we can, we can look at some of the alarms. Uh, typically once the operator, uh, gets the machine up and running, their interaction is going to be, uh, pretty minimal with the HMI unless they have an alarm. So looking at the alarm menu, we can see that there are some things where they can preview and get an idea of what this alarm is going to do and how to recover from that. And it gives them a step-by-step -step process on how to do it. Um, let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and try and uh, demonstrate what an alarm would look like if it were to occur when the machine's running. So in this particular case, if the glue tank wasn't ready, we can see that it's gonna give up a big red banner across very easily uh, recognizable. And then in some cases, you'll have a little belt, which is going to give you some additional information. Um, and then behind that, we've actually got glue tank not ready. So again, it will prompt a user. They can simply click on the, on the screen on the front and then gain more information about how to recover from this particular alarm. So a changeover is pretty simple. We can go to the to the home menu and then change over. Um, the first process would be to select uh, a different product. In this particular application, there isn't any names given here, so we have recipe one or two. Um, once you make that selection, we can then go look and see what values need to be adjusted. And that might be better for somebody who has experience already with the machine. So if somebody who doesn't have experience can come back here and look at the map, and then it gives them a map view of where these particular changeover points are gonna be located. Um, from here, we can actually just click on change point number one, for example, and it will give you more information. Here it has a value at the top. We need to set change point one to 3.9. If we don't know where that's at, this uh, picture gives an illustration of, of where that item is located. If there's still further information, they can click on the little information dot to get details about exactly what they are needing to do. Loosen the handle, crank the handle, retighten it. Um, once they've completed that step, they can go ahead and check the box and then close that down. They can move on to the next change point. And then they can follow through each of those in sequence. Now, if we go back to the other menu, you can see, so an advanced user might understand where all of these are already, and they can simply look down the list and check them off as they've completed them. If they do forget where it is, then they can simply click on the, the change point number again and indicate whether they've completed that task or not. So changeovers are really, really straightforward and simple. And again, this machine only has four change points. You might have seven, or eight, 12, and you just simply follow through the list and uh, very, very straightforward. So what are some features that maintenance techs appreciate? 
from a maintenance tech and even for engineers like myself, we, uh, we find that the input output is very, very helpful. Um, if we're trying to troubleshoot something or understand why the machine keeps jamming, we can go and look at the input output map. And in this particular case, we can see a number of sensors. And this is showing to us real time what, uh, what those sensors are doing. Let me see if I can go ahead and get one to toggle for us so we can actually see that change. So here we're looking at photo line number two, and we can see that that's toggling now. If we don't know what photo line number two is, we can simply click on that. And again, it will give us a description of what it is. We can already see where it's at. And, uh, and then we can understand basically what it's trying to do. Um, this, this is really, really good because if uh, we see a particular sensor or device out on the machine, um, that is having a response, uh, but we're not actually seeing that in the, in the HMI or the PLC, then we know that we've got a broken wire or some, somehow the signal is not getting back to the, to the machine. And that might be part of the reason of why it's failing. Um, there's also another really good feature for the maintenance people. Um, if an output device has failed or a cylinder doesn't extend or something like that, we can go to this output testing. Now they have to log in with uh, with credentials to be able to do that. Uh, once they've done that, it should allow them to get to this output testing menu. In order to be able to do any of these functions, first we need to put this in manual mode. And then we need to make sure that the safety circuit is satisfied. Give me a moment to go ahead and satisfy that safety circuit here. And then at this point, we can click on any one of these items and uh, we only have two in this particular case, but uh, we can force the, the flat kicker solenoid on or off. Again, all of the doors and other safety mechanisms have to be in place so that they can't unintentionally hurt themselves or somebody else. But uh, it's a very good way for the whole system to kind of test itself from, uh, from the machine standpoint. The, Maintenance people don't need to open the computer or any other equipment to that to just do these simple checks. So a customer really can set up a new case size on their own now? So if, if a customer wants to set up a, a recipe on their own, we would probably go in. We're going to go into the setup and recipe edit. Let's go ahead and add a new one. And we'll just say that this is going to be a, a new set up and once that gets into the, uh, the menu there all right so here are the values for uh, for this setup so they would need to set the material into the machine and up adjust it appropriately for their equipment and their product and then we could enter in values that align with uh, the numbers that they have specified. So again, if they were to go to the image, you would set your case inside the, uh, the belts here, for example, adjust the crank handle in, and then we would record the number and set all of these numbers in so that we know what it would be for the next person to come along and enter it. So what about palletizers? Um, a lot of customers want to know if they can create new pallet patterns on their own. Our standard palletizers, they come with a pallet configuration tool. So can you briefly show us how that pallet configuration tool looks like and how easy it is to, to change a recipe or set up a new pallet configuration? Okay, so I have a video reference of, of uh, an example of when we set up a palletizer using our HMI in this particular example, um, I've got an HMI screen that we would actually have on the equipment. And then in the background, I've got uh, an emulation model, which uh, virtualizes the real equipment. In this case, we are uh, finding what the, uh, the case size would be, what that product size is. And then we're creating a new recipe uh, for that. So in this particular case, we're just entering the dimensions in. And then I'm going to just fast forward this a little bit. 
So once you get the product dimensions entered in, uh, we can choose a, a pallet pattern that might be a, a solution that the palletizer can figure out for us. In this case, we're gonna go ahead and lock this in. There's a couple of layers, we can flip those uh, so you get a better pallet stack. Let me go ahead and advance this just a little bit further. We can tell it whether to flip or not flip. And then it's it's got a number of uh, settings here so that the robot will place these products in the correct sequence and uh, with the, the correct uh, approach distances and angles. Um, if those aren't set and those are ignored, then uh, you likely will get boxes that will get crushed as you're trying to palletize that. So you go ahead and set those things up and then let me go ahead and advance the video again. Uh, if you need to fine tune some positions, it has an example at uh, the three minute and 40 second mark. And then we'll go ahead and start the system. We always recommend that if you're doing this uh, with your real equipment, you want to run this system slow. Initially, you don't want to run this thing fast. You've got to make sure that all of these approaches and, and offsets are working correctly. So again, uh, looking at the video reference, this is running very slow. Um, we can kind of follow along in the, uh, in the HMI and see where it should be building things according to the pattern. So those first two placements look good. They haven't uh, crushed any boxes or anything like that. The next one should place in the location that's highlighted there, uh, which in this case would be uh, case number uh, six, I believe. Anyways, as uh, as you verify those things, I'm going to go ahead and advance this just a little bit so we can see that it builds a full layer and then the second layer is built as well. So we have uh, built two complete layers, one which is mirrored and one which isn't mirrored. And now we're going to go back into this. Oftentimes people want labels in specific positions. And so that's what this example is showing is how do we correlate and then rotate the cases. And we work through a number of options there. I'll go ahead and fast forward this video once again and go ahead and let it build the next layer. So there the, the cases are now facing labels out as we would expect. For that layer, as well as the mirrored layer, you can see as it rotates around. And then uh, once you're satisfied and have built a complete layer, you would wanna check it on on one side of the palletizer as well as the other. And at that point, you should be in a spot where you can go ahead and speed up the, the palletizer and feel comfortable with this operation going forward. So it's it's a very visual HMI. I mean, even for somebody that's not very technical like myself, it is not intimidating. So I think a lot of the operators will really appreciate. Um, another important element to remember is that our portfolio covers a rect pack seal palletized. That means uh, that the HMI is the same across the entire portfolio. And that's really important. Thank you, Sean, for showing us uh, what intuitive means to Pearson. And uh, I hope that our customers agree that it is an intuitive interface. <laughs>